Uh, welcome. I'm Mark Tokola. I'm the vice president of the Korea Economic Institute. Let me make a brief plug for KEI first. Uh, we are a think tank and public outreach organization founded in 1982. Uh, our purpose is to promote mutual understanding between the United States and the Republic of Korea. You can find more about our programs and our, read our blog, and we have social media on KEIA.org. Uh, we're delighted to have with us today uh, Professor Walter Clemens, author of the new book, North Korea and, and the World, Human Rights, Arms Control, and Strategies for Negotiation. Uh, we have copies of the book available for your purchase after the talk, which Professor Clemens has kindly agreed to sign. Professor Clemens is associate at the Harvard University Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. He's Professor Emeritus of, Boston, of Political Science at Boston University. He served as executive officer of the White House Committee on Arms Control and Disarmament for International Cooperation, Cooperation in 1965. He's one of the few scholars to predict the demise of the Soviet Union. And he played tackle on an Ohio High School state Holy championship cow. football team. Holy cow. <laughs> He's the author of many books. If you think they don't do good research here, <laughs> you're wrong. We do. Our work. <laughs> My goodness. He's the author of many books. If it's only on the defensive team, I was the tackle. Defensive tackle. Yes. Okay, that's, uh, wouldn't be offensive. No. <laughs> I was a pacifist at an early age. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask Professor Clemens to discuss this book, uh, perhaps without giving away the ending, because I want to give you an incentive to purchase it. And then I'll have a few questions for him, and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. I know you'll have things to ask about this important and timely topic. So, Professor Clements, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'll try to review some of the uh, main themes of this book, Human Rights, Arms Control, Strategies for Negotiation. But the very title, North Korea and the World, I first got interested in North Korea in 1952. I went to a, um, a conference in Vienna, uh, the Peoples for Peace, sponsored by a Communist Front. And one of the features there was a North Korean movie about how the Americans were using biological warfare against uh, North Korea. It showed photographs or movies, simulated movies, of American planes dropping big cans, and rats came out of these cans, and they went on to allegedly infect uh, quite a bit of the North Korean population. Um, it turned out that uh, the, the, this stuff was not true, and even the North Koreans admitted as much. And, seemed to have embarrassed even the, the Soviet Union, which was uh, sponsoring um, this uh, event and this kind of propaganda. But it, it gave me <clears throat> some insight into how North Korean uh, affairs could shape a larger part of the world than just Northeast Asia. At this conference, um, there were people from all over the world, including Japanese students, who were extremely thin. And I noticed they didn't um, eat much of their food. And uh, they explained to me that, <clears throat> but this was 1952, uh, there was not a lot of money then in Japan. And they gave blood once a month for, to make money, gave blood for American soldiers fighting in Korea. So they had kind of unpleasant um, uh, impression of, uh, what was going on up there. Well, during that year, it was uh, my um, se second year in college, um, I had many encounters with Soviet troops that were still occupying Vienna. And many of our encounters were based on misunderstandings. And so I resolved to spend most of my, the rest of my life trying to improve understanding, particularly between the Soviet Union and the United States. So I worked on that for a long time. But in 1970, the US government, the US Information Agency, sent me to Asia to lecture on Soviet foreign policy. And while there, I was in Korea and went to Panmunjom. And I saw that on the south, southern side, they were building one sort of building. And on the north side, they were trying to build something a little bit higher. So this was you know, tit for tat. And it, it seemed kind of silly. But I began to think, what 
uh, what have we learned about U.S. relations with the Soviet Union that might be applicable or helpful in dealing with North Korea? And <clears throat> a couple years later, I learned about a book called An Alternative to War or Surrender by Charles Osgood, who was then the president of the American Psychological uh, Association. And his suggestion was that um, when you're caught in a spiral of conflict, you should take some kind of steps to reverse the conflict and move it toward detente. And his idea was, if you wish to do that, that um, somebody high up in the government should make an, a pronouncement and said, to say, we are going to try to reverse conflict and move toward detente and then take small steps, and if the other side reciprocates, take bigger steps. When I was at the DMC, I met with an uh, American second lieutenant who said that he tried to smile once at a North Korean soldier as he walked by, and soon he found himself being jostled by other North Korean soldiers. He had tried to take a small step to improve relations, and instead it wound up worsening relations. So I thought that sort of supported Osgood's idea that if you want to reverse the, t the tension spiral, it has, you have to have an announcement by somebody high up. And um, that did not yet, that, that ha did not happen then, and it led to more conflict rather than less. But uh, Osgood's um, method is called GRIT, Graduated Reciprocation and Tension Reduction. And I'll come back to that a little bit later when I try to talk about strategies of negotiation. So the th three themes of my book are human rights, arms control, and um, strategies for negotiation. Now human rights and arms control is it possible to work for both of these goals at the same time? Uh, the Soviet, uh, two Soviet Nobel Prize winners had different opinions about that. Uh, Solzhenitsyn said the Soviet government is so bad uh, mm -hmm. to its own people that it's crazy for outsiders to try to think they could negotiate with them and get any kind of a deal that would last. Um, if a government is terrible to its own people, um, the chances of its obeying some kind of international agreement are very small. The other Soviet, Soviet Nobel Prize winner, Andrei Sakharov, said, no, peace is so important that it's important to try to negotiate <clears throat> with a regime like the Soviet um, be, to do anything to avoid the chance of nuclear war. And um, some of you may have opinions about this subject. Um, is there a contradiction in working to improve human rights at the same time you try to lessen the chances of nuclear war? Is it possible to have both? Now, as it happened, I took part in the, the first student exchange of graduate students between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1958-59. Um, to make a long story short, I think that these cultural exchanges with the Soviet Union helped to bring down the system over there. Um, my counterpart um, in 1958-59 was a Soviet scholar who studied the New Deal in the United States. And he saw how reforms, in a sense, could, could save the American system and change it and make it better. And that guy turned out to be an advisor to Gorbachev later on, um, and on his new thinking, on perestroika, and so on. Um, it seemed to me that in 1958-59 that the 20 American students in, Soviet, in, the, in, in Moscow and Leningrad were having a, um, a very subversive effect. You know, 
we were very few in number, but we were in contact with um, what would become uh, elites of the Soviet Union. We were popular for our, the, we had jazz records. And I brought in with me a, um, a copy of Dr. Zhivago uh, in English. And the Soviets were so anxious to learn what's in this book that they would congregate in my room and I would try to translate uh, Boris Pasternak from English back into Russian. And this went on for uh, three or four times. And of course, my room was, was bugged and everybody got in trouble for this kind of thing. But anyway, in the long run, it had a kind of a subversive effect, I think. Um, now in the mid-1970s, the Soviets signed on to, and we, uh, many countries, signed on to what became the Hel Helsinki Accords, which legitimated the pursuit of human rights everywhere. And if the Soviets cracked down on somebody, uh, we could say you're violating the Helsinki Accords. And um, ultimately, these human rights, you know, liberalization of human rights, happened in tandem with more and more arms controls with the Soviet Union. Uh, I suppose the, the insights about the condition of human rights in, in, in North Korea are pretty well known. Um, Marcus Noland and uh, Stephen Haggard at the, um, at the Peterson Institute uh, arranged surveys with many defectors in, in South Korea. Um, the, um, the United Nations conducted its own uh, uh, set of investigations. And you know, the results tend to parallel each other. Uh, Ambassador King here uh, is in the front row here from uh, who knows about the uh, human rights conditions in the North. And I might ask him later on to add to whatever I have to say today. Um, my own sense of how these defectors' stories come together uh, has been enhanced by the novel The Orphan Master's Son um, by um, Adam uh, jo Johnson at um, Stanford University, which won a Pulitzer Prize. And he describes the life of people in North Korea and how you know, there is suspicion and if you're accused of something, you may wind up in a camp and your whole family will be persecuted. And how this all ties together with material incentives and fear and, and so on. So it's a real problem. And the United Nations has taken uh, cognizance of this. There's the UN uh, Human Rights Commission, which authorized uh, an inquiry into human rights in North Korea. Having heard that, they recommended to the General Assembly that the General Assembly take the matter to the Security Council. And the um, one recommendation is for the highest people at the highest level of the North Korean government to be indicted and brought before the criminal, UN, the criminal, International Criminal Court. Of course, Russia and uh, China are, would veto any sort of thing. Um, so we're left in a kind of limbo where many countries have formally condemned the Pyongyang regime, but um, what to do about it? Um, uh, there it seems to me that there is a kind of a tension between attempting to negotiate with the Pyongyang regime about arms control or anything else, tension between that and condemning their leadership for its violation of human rights and indeed of crimes against humanity. Um, it's almost inconceivable that um, they would um, give in to, that they would be very amenable to negotiations with the West when uh, their leaders are being denounced um, in such a s serious way. And yet, to be silent about these things seems to be unthinkable. Now, arms control. Um, I mean, Morton Halprin, who's still 
doing things in Washington, wrote a book on arms control where he summarized three major objectives. One is to reduce the danger of war, to reduce the, da the, the damage if war occurs, and three, to save money. But besides that, there are political objectives. Um, my own doctoral dissertation was about Lenin and disarmament. And Lenin saw that uh, disarmament negotiations could be a tool for dividing the other side, for promoting political groups in the other side that favor your orientation. Um, and uh, it, it's possible even to uh, embarrass the other side into making some sort of concessions that they might not otherwise make. Um, now, th these, these, these goals, uh, of course, um, could be applicable to negotiations between the United States and North Korea, uh, South Korea and North Korea. Now, um, I think that arms control negotiations with the North got a big boost in 1991-92 when President George H.W. Bush um, decided to pull nuclear weapons, uh, tactical nuclear weapons, back from abroad, including from North Korea, or from South Korea. And when that happened, South Korea and the North, uh, in 1992, reached an agreement on denuclearization, which was quite, it was frustrated by um, by the North, they refused to accept um, inspection, but the South didn't want to have inspection either. But anyway, that put in motion the, the, the possibility that there might be some kind of arms agreements uh, between the free world and, and North Korea. In uh, 1994, as most of you know, uh, there was an agreed framework between the U.S. and uh, North Korea that, in effect, froze their plutonium uh, production. Um, in return, the U.S. was supposed to help build two um, light water reactors, and in the meantime, provide fuel oil, um, heavy oil, to, uh, to the North. That seemed to work pretty well for about eight years, and then it um, fell apart. The, the agreement was denounced by each side. The North claimed the Americans were dragging their feet. They'd barely started work on the nuclear reactors um, many years after the initial accord. And the oil shipments often came in late. And the Americans said the North is violating this by uh, probably um, beginning use of uranium to make nuclear weapons. Um, the Bush administration, despite some early resistance to negotiation with the North, did sponsor these six par party talks that did lead to some accords, or to, to general to statements, joint statements, pledging various things in, um, in 2005 and in 2007. But those agreement, those joint statements, fell apart for various reasons, but one, the, the Americans raised the bar a little bit and wanted more inspection than the North was willing to grant. Um, people argue about whether arms control is a worthwhile thing to negotiate at all. Many of the agreements we've had with the Soviets have blown up, and um, even the, the most extensive one, the international, the intermediate nuclear forces accord is being challenged by each side now. Well, I'd like to review with you 10 approaches to dealing with North Korea. Uh, these are summarized in the, in the back of, uh, in the final chapter of my book. First one is, Try to ignore North Korea. Now, it seems to me that 
the U.S. has, in fact, if not ignored, minimized uh, the importance of Korea in its foreign policy since the 1870s. Um, in general, uh, regardless of the strategic location of Korea, the Americans have put much greater weight on dealing with China, Japan, and Russia. And when the, uh, when the Japanese absorbed uh, Korea into their empire, the United States did not protest. We wanted only to be sure that our property interests would not be jeopardized. And, uh, from 1911 to 1942, no American president, nobody in the U.S. government, used the word Korea in public. 1911 to 1942. Even Walter Lippmann's commission of what to do with the world after World War I did not mention Korea. We ex completely accepted that Korea was part of Japan. During the war, uh, Syngman Rhee and others called on the U.S. to recognize them, a, uh, recognize um, Korea as an independent state, let it take part in the UN, um, in the founding of the UN, and the U.S. said no. Franklin Roosevelt uh, thought that there should be an international trusteeship for Korea. There's kind of a racist element here. The, the Koreans are not you know, ready to negotiate, to uh, govern themselves. Roosevelt talked about a trusteeship that might go on for 25 or 30 years. Even Stalin thought that was too long, but he agreed with the um, American position that there should be a trusteeship. Well, the details of the trusteeship were not uh, formalized. And in August 1945, the Soviet army was coming into the north, and the Americans were still far away. Um, Diplomat Dean Rusk suggested let's offer the Russians to divide uh, Korea at the 38th parallel. And amazingly, the Soviets accepted this. Amazingly, because they were in a position to dominate the whole country, and uh, the, the Americans were pretty far away. So anyway, uh, North Korea was, um, uh, Korea was divided at the 38th parallel, and but the United States gave very little priority to their part of, of Korea. Uh, the, they were very reluctant to send any kind of heavy armaments. They withdrew their troops. The Americans withdrew most of their troops in 1948, 49. Um, the Soviets, meanwhile, were arming the North and helped them finally to, uh, they thought they were well enough prepared to conquer to, and absorb the South in 1950. But the, the theme I'm trying to address is American indifference to the existence and the importance of Korea in world affairs. So I think to ignore that sort of a place like that is impossible. What about the Obama position? The Obama administration um, did negotiate uh, what's called the, uh, uh, April, the April, sorry, um, in early um, 2012, uh, Leap Day Accord, in which we would provide some food to the North in exchange for various concessions, including a moratorium on, um, on missile and bomb tests. That blew up in two months. The North uh, conducted um, a rocket, a, a test they call a rocket test, to, attempting to put a satellite into space. So that destroyed that agreement. It seems the Obama administration has um, made some efforts since then to open the possibility of renewed negotiations. But usually the Americans have been saying, before those negotiations take place, we insist that the North commit itself to de denuclearization. 
just recently, John Kerry, he said that, and then he softened it a little bit. He said, um, we want them at least to be willing to bring that up, to have denuclearization as one of the topics for the negotiation. But there, there's been a consistent pattern that whenever the Americans propose something to the, to some kind of talk to the North, they preface it by saying the North is terrible and we want them to dis, commit to disarmament. And all of this makes it very hard to get the momentum going toward negotiation. So while we have been practicing strategic patience, the North has continued to improve its missile and nuclear bomb um, hardware, and the repression of human rights has continued. So it seems to me that strategic patience has netted us nothing. That is the second approach. Third approach, Fortress America. Um, some people at the Cato Institute have suggested, if North Korea is a problem, let the South Koreans and the Japanese and the Chinese and the Russians, let them take care of it. It's very far from the United States. Let the neighbors of North Korea uh, try to deal with the country. Um, well, this could lead to all kinds of possibilities. It would increase the chances that Japan and South Korea would choose to build their own nuclear weapons. Um, preventive war, uh, the Clinton administration, that's a, a fourth possibility, the Clinton administration in 1994 considered a surgical strike on, on the North's uh, facility, nuclear facilities. It might have been feasible then. By now they have um, some, uh, some nuclear warheads and uh, the chance of any kind of um, a surgical strike, uh, a surgical strike becomes almost unthinkable because of the dangers of escalation and pollution of a large area. One of my colleagues at Harvard, uh, a Korean American, June Beck, she has a book coming out calling for hack and frack. She thinks the Americans should use, and the South Koreans should use their computer facilities to really disrupt uh, life in, the, in, the, in North Korea and use whatever communication uh, hardware and software we have to uh, demoralize the people there and sort of weaken the country from um, inside. Um, I think it's um, doubtful that this kind of activity mounted from the outside could really uh, subvert a totalitarian regime. I talked earlier about how I thought cultural exchange helped to d disintegrate the Soviet system, but I think the, the totalitarian dictatorship in North Korea is much stronger than, than it was in, in the Soviet Union in, in recent in, in, in the 1950s and 60s. What about stepping up international pressure? More UN sanctions, tighter US sanctions, and so on. Um, these sanctions seem to hurt the North Korean economy a little, but uh, John Park at Harvard and MIT, James Walsh, they argue that there is now a, a class of entrepreneurs, North Korean entrepreneurs and, and Chinese entrepreneurs, who are really getting rich by um, smuggling South, uh, Chinese stuff into North Korea um, bypassing whatever controls may exist. And uh, the, uh, the result is that the scientists there in the North are still getting whatever they need, and the elite is still able to enjoy a rather pampered life. Um, I mentioned before, the UN um, com Committee on Inquiry has 
recommended tighter sanctions. And they've got a whole program of how to democratize the North. But it seems to me that pressure from the outside um, is not going to achieve its, its objectives. Another possibility is to really work for unification of North and South. The South Korean government in recent years has sometimes talked as though that were feasible. They seem more confident that the financial burdens could be shouldered. The burdens would be countered by whatever gain came from employing low-cost North Korean labor, um, liberated and energized with South Korean capital. Um, well, there are pros and cons. It's possible that unification could also lead to chaos, that the elites in the North would um, be fighting among each other and maybe um, trying to squeeze the last bit of whatever they could from the, from the people. And as yet, I think there's no agreement between China and the United States. If there were unification, what do we do with the nuclear stuff that's up there close to Pyongyang? Um, you could conceivably get a, con a race by the Chinese and the Americans and the South Koreans to see who would be able to take over that material. Unless it's coordinated, it could become um, a very dangerous situation. We could also hope that North Korea might somehow fo follow a Chinese model, reform somewhat, and sort of join the world in the way that the Chinese have. Um, Rudiger Frank, the uh, Viennese Korea expert, um, has visited Razon, uh, the port on the um, eastern uh, coast of uh, North Korea, pretty close to, to Russia where there are facilities, docking, dock facilities, wharfs for China, for, for Russia, and North Korea. He found that Razon um, is a pretty um, liberated looking place. You can change money uh, at the normal rates, black market rates, real rates. Um, there's a lot of freedom that doesn't exist in other parts of North Korea. But foreign investment has not come in. Foreign investors are, of course, worried about um, the, the legal situation. Uh, they may be expropriated. Um, Frank uh, thought that Razon shows what North Korea could be, but also what it cannot be so long as you have a dictatorship like the one that they have now. And the Chinese and the Russians seem to sort of agree with this. They have been building up a Russian port short, just a little bit to the, to the north of uh, Razon, where they hope to do five or six times more trade volume than is ever projected for Razon. So the possibility of re reforming the North to become more like China, I think, is not very bright right now. China benefited a lot from having Deng Xiaoping, who said that it's great to be to become rich, and they were able to become rich even as they kept their dictatorship. Uh, but there's nobody like that in in the uh, North. There was one, perhaps the uncle of Kim Jong Un, but he was executed. In the meantime, um, our ninth approach, deter and contain. Of course, uh, we've been attempting to de deter um, North Korean aggression. We have military exercises with the South that show that, at least in terms of conventional weapons, ships and planes and everything else, that the alliance between United States and South Korea is so strong that an attack from the north 
could not succeed. Um, deterrence worked with the Soviet Union. Um, <clears throat> we deterred the Soviet Union at the same time that we negotiated with them and improved the condition for arms control and for human rights. I think uh, the, the, the tenth possibility is the one that offers the best hope. That's engage and negotiate. It's extremely hard to negotiate with a regime like this, and to negotiate anything. And yet there have been some accords. <clears throat> Sometimes the accords are blocked out by bad timing. Just this year, uh, on July 6th, uh, the North issued a statement saying they were in favor of denuclearization of the entire Korean peninsula. This was something like going back to their 1992 accord with, with the South. Um, but they insist on inspection of, of the South. They want denuclearization not only of South Korea, but of the vicinity. Now, who knows what vicinity means. Of course, there are American ships, uh, aircraft carriers, uh, missiles uh, that could be brought in to in, in, in time of, of war with the North. But anyway, this seemed like a hopeful statement by the, by the North. But on the same day, the United States decided to step up uh, pressure on the North and even uh, started to apply, we named Kim Jong-un as a target for sanctions. Um, these things happened on the same day. They were not coordinated. But timing, as, as you all know who have studied and practiced negotiation, timing can be very important. Um, Siegfried Hecker at Stanford University has suggested what we should try to negotiate is a deal based on three no's and one yes. The three no's are uh, that the North would commit to no more bombs, no more, um, uh, no better bombs, and no more testing. In effect, a freeze on what they have right now. In exchange, the United States would give some kind of security agreement to assuage their anxieties about uh, aggression from outside. Um, so I think that's a, a good idea. Uh, in effect, it would be arms control rather than disarmament. You know, disarmament implies getting rid of everything. Arms control means regulating it in some manner. So a freeze, there have been a couple freezes in, in US-Soviet uh, military development. And conceivably, a freeze would, might be acceptable to, to the North. It would permit them to claim that they have a, a nuclear deterrent, and that uh, along with this security accord, there would probably have to be diplomatic relations with the United States and per, I guess with South Korea. There would have to be a peace treaty uh, to replace the armistice. There would have to be some regulation, some modification of the northern limit line, which you know, has occasioned a lot of conflicts over the years. Um, there would have to be uh, a, a, probably a gradual reduction in all kinds of sanctions directed against the North. Um, Stephen Linton, the head of the Eugene Bell Foundation, gave a talk here recently about his efforts to deliver anti-tuberculosis drugs to the North. When he was a professor at Columbia University in the 1990s, he, at that time, had accompanied Billy Graham uh, on a trip that, to, in which Graham 
that with Kim Jong Kim Kim Il Sung. Um, anyway, Clinton was a specialist in Korean religion. He now <laughs> is in charge of delivering tuberculosis drugs, but then he was uh, a, a specialist in Korean religion. His experience led him to this idea that uh, to deal with North Korea, you don't want to use a lot of legalisms. What they go for is a demonstration of trust and of some sort of personal um, ties that, that could supersede any legal difficulties. Um, so he thought that if we try to negotiate with the North, it should be by sending somebody at a fairly high level. Now, in 1990, uh, the North Koreans sent one of their top military leaders to Washington, and he begged Bill Clinton to go to Pyongyang. He said, if you do, you can resolve everything, missiles and uh, rockets and, and uh, bombs. Well, Clinton was busy with the Middle East, and he didn't go, but Madeleine Albright went. And she came back thinking that um, the North Korean leadership was ready for a deal, a far-reaching deal, on, on missiles and on bombs. But it was the very end of the, um, of the Clinton years, and the George Bush administration came in, so nothing was done with that. But it's, that was one of several suggestions, uh, signs that, that the North Koreans might possibly respond to a high level um, uh, accord with the United States. It seems to me that, uh, that um, uh, you know, there's a, a problem. How, for example, would you couldn't expect President, um, um, uh, the American President, or even the Secretary of State to go and sort of kowtow in front of um, North Korean leader. But perhaps foreign ministers meeting in some third place like Thailand or China, um, if, if, if it was at a high level and each side abstained from bad-mouthing the other, uh, that there might be possibility for negotiation. So this route, is, this tenth route, negotiation and engagement, um, does not offer, you know, the past shows each side makes blunders that kind of mess up the negotiations. But it seems to me it's the only hope that we have. And uh, right now it's, it's the end of one administration, but I hope that the next one um, takes off and tries to move in that direction. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions for you, if I may. Would Please. Like to take a seat? Or? Okay. okay. Uh, Professor, your book begins with a good deal of kind of fascinating history about Korea, beginning 19th century, focusing on World War II and the aftermath. Um, do you think the history is for the purpose of informing readers about the context so they can understand today's issues better, or do negotiators need to know that history? Ah. And how does that influence their negotiating position then? <clears throat> I think knowledge of the history and the culture of whomever you're negotiating with is very important. Language skills also. Uh, some of the difficulties we had in 2002 when Mr. Kelly went to negotiate or he presented some arguments to the North they said, and the reports about the, the North's response have been very um, contradictory. Did they say they already were engaged in, in processing, in, in enriching uranium, or that they had the right to? Uh, some of this was a result of our, not, our leaders not knowing the Korean language. Um, anyway, knowledge of, of the language and the culture, I think, is, is really important. In Russian, for example, the word arms control raised problems for a long time. Their word control is sort of a translation of the French control, which means accounting. 
And so they thought, oh, the, all the Americans want to do is count our weapons. But the American word control means some kind of regulation. It could be more or less or the same. Um, so I think we all, we all need to, if we're trying to, the American public or the uh, leaders that are negotiating with the North uh, should know a lot about the history. My, my chapters there, some are based on Korean mythology about how Korean kings have always come from God, and uh, they, or at least they're the spokesman for, uh, if they're not God, they're the spokesman for God. And it helps to explain a little bit how North, North Koreans might have the ma mindset to accept the Kim dynasty as a reflection, or as God or the tool of God. I got the sense from your book, too, that you consider individuals to be really important, that Jimmy Carter and George W. Bush would take different approaches because they're different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Or that Richard Holbrook might get different results from Jimmy Carter, or equally constructive, perhaps. Would you say the same about North Korea? Do you have the sense that uh, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un are different people with different approaches? What? Oh, okay. It works. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Um, well, I think every father and son, and every grandfather and son and grandson, are are different. The son of um, Kim Il Sun is kind of short and ugly, and not as photogenic. It must have done something to his psyche. Uh, and this new guy uh, has lived outside of Korea. He has seen the world. Um, he's trying to make sure that he remains in power. Um, his, his life experiences have been different, very different from his grandfather and father. A priori, you'd have to expect him to be a lot different. Now, what I am surprised that he has been so bold. You would think that a young man doesn't know the system very well would take more time to move into power more gradually. Many of his actions seem bold and I would say counterproductive for him and for his country, but. Still, he's in power now for a few years. A um, South Korean professor gave a talk at Harvard recently. He said that in these dictatorships, if the new dictator lasts for five years, he's probably going to stay on until he dies a natural death. Um, so Kim Jong-un is already two or three years into that process. So by that logic, he's still got if he, live, if, he, if he endures another two years, he'll be there for a long time. Again, looking from kind of inside the North Korean perspective, how important do you think the U.S. actually is to them? Do they actually uh -huh. worry about us, or are they much more consumed by internal dynamics? Do we need to wait until they're ready for negotiation, until they consolidate power? Or do you think this is actually driven by their own internal politics, not about us at all? Um. Well, you know, the United States has been the subject of a kind of a love-hate relationship, not just for Koreans, but for Chinese and Japanese and a lot of Asians, a lot of people in the whole world, also Russians. Um, the United States was the first country to really recognize that Korea was independent of China. But then five or 10 years later, we signed a treaty of amity and friendship with North Korea, with Korea that implied that you know, it said if there's ever trouble that the U.S. will consult and consider what to do. But when the Japanese took over, uh, we gave them no help. The, South, the Koreans no no help at all. Um, Americans helped to make the Korean alphabet, Han, 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 Han Yung, um, a, a wide, what they use in school. A Korean, uh, American missionaries wanted the Bible translated into a language that everybody could read. 
and then they use this in their schools. And so Amer uh, Korean schools, universities, uh, medical facilities got a major boost from Americans. And some of those Americans, by the way, complained to Washington that we were not doing enough to limit the Japanese penetration. Um, a lot of, you know, Kim, Kimmel's, uh, um, Singman Rhee studied with uh, Woodrow Wilson at Princeton University, had high hopes for the idea of national self-determination, um, and then was disappointed by what the U.S. ultimately did. Um, so th th there are reasons why Koreans have, they looked well, I, I go back a step in the 1880s, 1890s, they saw that Edison was electrifying Boston. They wanted their own palace in Seoul to be electri electrified. And, and it was before the palaces in China and Japan. Um, so they've looked up to the US, but they've also been disappointed um, often. And, so that l lies in the background here. Surely they know that the United States is the only superpower now. And occasionally we you know, show we can fly our bombers from somewhere in the Pacific over uh, Korea. Um, they know that they were carpet bombed in world, in, during the Korean War. Many of them still think that they didn't start the war uh, and the Americans carpet bombed North Korea. Um, and then, you know, another thing, when people say things often enough, they be, men be, begin to believe them. And they've been saying a lot of terrible things about the United States. No, I'd say none any more severe than the Philippine president recently did, um, on the same level, more or less. Um, so they, do they really fear the U.S.? Yes. But they also realize, well, one of my students at, at Boston University, a Korean woman, wrote her doctoral dissertation arguing that um, at least under Kim Il-sung and his son, the Koreans, North Koreans were willing, always willing, to trade nukes for acceptance by the United States. It was a trade-off. And so they didn't get acceptance. They didn't get recognition. Um, we promised to do something in 1994, but did not. And uh, so they continued on their nuclear path. I want to save time for audience questions. Let me just ask a couple more, and then we'll turn to the audience. Um, about midway through the book, you described this grit, the grit process, Professor Osgood's notion of gradual, graduated reciprocation. On the end of the book, you've got the kind of a grand bargain outlined. Do we need to go through grit before we get to the grand bargain, oh, oh. or can we go, go right to the grand bargain? <laughs> well, Professor Osgood said you should follow the rules. But um, Henry Kissinger did not, and Nixon did not, when they dealt with China. They did not announce in any public way that they wanted normalization of relations with China. Instead, they had all kind of circuitous ways to show the Chinese that we were, wanted to talk. Um, one of the grip-like things that, that Kissinger did, the Chinese wanted to buy some French trucks, but the trucks had Westinghouse engines in them. And up to that point in time, we said to the French, you may not sell a truck with an American engine to the Chinese. But then we, re we relaxed that. And we began to permit American tourists in Hong Kong to bring home stuff that said made in China. So these are very uh, small steps, but there was never any open statement and no explanation to the American people until after it happened. It turned out there was hardly any, and no, and no warning to the Japanese that it was going to happen. So. I don't know, Kissinger and Nixon, they like to do things in secret. I think it, it was probably fun for them. But on balance, I think it was unnecessary and counterproductive. I mean, any fool could say, China's there. <laughs> we should have negotiation relations with them. 
And by the way, on the subject of human rights, most of the horrible, the Mao Zedong's greatest violations of human rights were before we normalized relations with them. After we, in the, in the mid 70s, things were not so bad. And my final question before I turn to the audience is uh, actually an Korea question. As somebody who's followed arms control talks for a long time, how do you see the future? Do you think the non-proliferation treaty can hold, or is proliferation inevitable? Well, I don't know if it's, uh, I don't think it's inevitable. Nothing is really inevitable. And, you know, we've had more success stopping nuclear proliferation than most people expected 20 or 30 years ago. Some American presidents predicted it'd be 20 or 30 nuclear um, power, 20 or 30 countries with nukes, but instead there's less than 10. Um, the fact that uh, some really knowledgeable Americans high up say that we should really constrain our nuclear programs right now could have an effect on the, if, if the next administration is, Dem is led by Democrats, uh, we might conceivably um, taper, uh, not go for a, a trillion dollar military buildup. As long as we set the pace, others are you know, gonna follow. Um, but you know, we, we, the fact that we have seem to have stopped um, Iran I think is, is a positive harbinger. If you pr present enough carrots and enough sticks, you might be able to deter Iran. But conceivably, um, Korea. I don't. I don't know why that North Korean, why, why why the Korean, why the Iranian example would not, if adapted creatively, apply to North Korea as well. But it's important to, to do something with North Korea, otherwise Japan and South Korea are ready to, to, to become nuclear weapons states. I've, I've been selfish. Um, Ma'am. Um, Thank you. I hope I say it right. I depend a lot on you. Okay, <laughs> you did. Um, uh, Imagining that negotiations with Korea um, do happen in the next um, administration, um, looking back onto the recent experience of the Iran nuclear deal and the animosity from many lawmakers to the negotiations, which stemmed from, um, in my view, a lot of ideal, ideological strong dislike for Iran and how many thought it was just unacceptable to just negotiate with the Iranians in the first place. So there is similar, if not even higher, animosity to the North Korean regime and recognizing that a number of the sanctions on North Korea are statutory. I'm wondering if there's a possibility of Congress doing what it did in the Iran case and passing legislation giving itself the right to approve of any uh, potential um, agreement with North Korea, even if that agreement isn't presented as a treaty. And if that's the case, what the historical US animosity to the North Korean regime would mean for the potential of any agreement? Well, that's a good question. And it's certainly, um, you have, um, <clears throat> hit on, on what could be, you know, even if the administration, uh, if the executive branch reaches an agreement with North Korea, it could be torpedoed or frustrated by the legislature. Not just sanctions, it's would we ever give them um, admission to international trade organization um, to, to the general treaty of preferences. Um, I suppose the, the answer to your question really hinges on who controls the next Congress. If, it, if the Senate happens to be mostly controlled by Democrats, that would make the, the problems that you raise less, but even so, the, the Democrats would have to have a strong majority to, to, to win uh, approval of legislation.
with the Soviet Union, the, the Congress also uh, frustrated some of the accords for, for a long time. Um, kept the accords that um, penalized the, the Soviets for their treatment of Jews for a long time. That's a big, big issue. Back here, yes, sir. Yes, you. Professor Clemens, as a scholar, oh, sorry, as a scholar of international relations, you're of course aware of the democratic peace phenomena, the fact that democracies don't fight democracies or haven't gone to war. People have theorized for a long time why that might be the case and come up with a number of possible explanations. One of the most appealing is the mutual transparency of democracies. That is, they're less likely to be surprised even by another country which is hostile if it's a democracy. I, I wonder if our negotiations with the North Koreans were to focus on transparency, we might achieve some progress. Uh, it doesn't threaten the regime. Um, it removes the, ele the element of tension and surprise uh, that might go, might go along with it and, and allows for progress on an area that allows some you might say non-central agreement, which might then lead to more significant. Do you think there's any chance of that um, having a, making a contribution? It seems to me that um, the transparency is the last thing that they would be willing to um, do. They might be willing to limit the number of bombs or missiles, but to open up the society so that everybody could know what, what was going on? Soviets uh, kept people like me within 35 miles of Moscow. We were not allowed to go out further than that. The fact that, um, <clears throat> you know, the experience of various tourist groups is that they led to a few sites in Pyongyang. If they go somewhere out in the country, they, they drive very fa as fast as possible on these kind of bad roads. And they get there, and they're not allowed to talk to anybody except a few that are authorized to speak with them. I would just kind of turn this around and say, lack of transparency is likely to continue, and that's a real challenge to mutual trust. We'll go to this side and we'll come back. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Um, Stanley Cobert, I'd like to pick up on a couple of things you said. Um, first, on the leader as having some sort of religious importance, divine right of kings. Um, if you go back to Adolf Hitler, he said the same thing, in effect, that he couldn't have accomplished what he did unless there was some sort of higher power, a divinity watching over him. This, this was not the work of man alone. He thought he was divinely chosen to return Germany to greatness. And the purges that Kim Jong-un has been doing, which have surprised everybody, including in particular the murder of his uncle, is very reminiscent of the light of the Night of the Long Knives, the speed with which it has been done, the ruthlessness, the closeness. You know, Hitler ordering the murder of his closest associate, Ernst Röhm in the Night of the Long Knives. I know there are people, you know, you can overdo the analogies to Hitler, but these two aspects of it make me a little worried because Hitler was not responsive to the normal considerations of negotiation and deterrence. You know, if you think you are the agent of God to restore your country to greatness, you're beyond those normal considerations. That's why I picked up on what you just said. So I wonder if you can elaborate on that some more. Well, a historian might say that the good news is that the English monarchy around 1500 and the, Russia, and the founder in Russia when the Romanovs were started were at least as bloody as North Korea 
um, and yet they have evolved. Um, the, the battles between potential kings uh, and their successors and people who didn't follow the, the, exactly the same religion uh, were horrendous. And yet, um, I don't know about Russia, but England has now become uh, a very tolerant uh, democratic society. Um, I imagine that Kim Jong-un, uh, if he keeps saying that his father and grandfather and he are God kings, that he will tend to believe that. Um, just to challenge this a little bit, or, or uh, as a think, there's a new uh, book coming out called "Stop North Korea" by Shepard Iverson at Inha University. And he says the way to stop North Korea is to offer them, uh, offer the elites, three hundred billion dollars. Uh, you divide this money among all the, the military and political leaders and economic leaders. And you tell them to accept unification and step down from any position of power. Um, promise n not to prosecute them for whatever they have done. Just bribe them to be good boys and girls. Um, so, but if they believe, if, uh, if at least the Kim family believes that they are tools of God, then issues of honor come in to, to the, into play not just material benefits. And I imagine that they might feel that they are letting down God or their grandfather or something if they accepted a billion dollars to, to live in comfort in Switzerland or somewhere else. OK. Yes, this side. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you, Professor. Mike Billington. I'm with the Executive Intelligence Review. Um, I have two related questions on the strategic crisis. Uh, and let me say I admire very much your position on this and agree. But let, on Razon, I would on what? On on Razon? Razon, mm -hmm. I would have a different view. I mean, as you know, CoRail and POSCO and Hyundai Marine were active there. This mm -hmm. was, they were actually in a consortium with Russia and North Korea. This was a dramatic move, not, not a huge economic expansion, but a very, very dramatic political move towards what could have been a peace through development approach. Uh, and uh, that was, and coal was traveling, you know, there was actual South Korean, North Korean business, not just Kaesong, but there too. And this was all shut down. And uh, whether or not Buck and Hay shut down Kaesong and Rasong and, and all, everything really, on her own or under pressure from Obama, and, and Ash Carter. Nonetheless, it's the fact that South Korea is now part of a massive, massive military buildup by the United States on the Russian and Chinese border in Europe as well as in Asia, uh, which uh, is not in keeping with what's going on in Southeast Asia, as you mentioned, in the Philippines, where they're turning against this militarization of the Philippines against China. Um, but this is, uh, I think, very dangerous. But I'd ask you to comment on that, but also to what extent you think we can, we meaning the world, reestablish this kind of development approach uh, towards bringing North Korea into collaboration with Russia, China, and South Korea, and the United States, if we'd wake up to that. Um, if you look at uh, freedom in the world, you uh, find that North Korea <laughs> is one of the least free countries in the world. But so is Russia, so is China, so are uh, most of the former Soviet countries like republics like Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Laos isn't much better. Um, I think there's a real question. This goes back to uh, Professor Linden's question about uh, transparency. Uh, can you, should you, try to negotiate with a country that is not at all democratic? Is it feasible? Um, and I've been a big supporter of um, <clears throat> arms control accords with the Soviet government, but now that we have Putin you know, uh, acting sort of like Hitler, 
uh, taken Hitler, taking uh, territories that where he claims, uh, you know, they're Rus they're, our people are there, and so we should take it. Uh, we can take it, and the Chinese, uh, you know, are I think trying to take over most of the South China Sea. Can you really negotiate with a regime that has such expansionist, imperialistic um, objectives? Now, so far, North Korea has, has well, the only place they seem to be want to take over is, is South Korea, but that's pretty significant too. Um, Can, can can money cut through all of this? You know, there, there was a, the Manchester School of Economists thought that if we have enough international trade in the 19th century, that there will be lasting peace. There was, but but Russia and Germany in 1914 were their uh, major trading partners. Russia and Germany in 1941 were also major uh, trading partners. Um, so I'm all in favor of, make, of carrying out trade agreements with your um, agreement with your adversaries, but I don't think you can count on them to provide peace. Ah, uh, quickly. I want to strongly counter that, if I may. You, you say they're like Hitler, they're aggressors, and so forth. The reality of the world today is that the BRICS nations—Russia, China, India have formed a new global economic policy based on development. Almost the entire world is turning to them for friendship and development, as opposed to the warmongering that's coming out of this country. What uh, are you talking about? I said Russia is acting like... You said Russia and China, both. Oh, okay, Russia and this China. This is... Uh, I won't go into a long debate on it, but mm -hmm. I mean, I think the world is characterized by the BRICS nations and their allies taking great development projects into South America, into Asia, into Africa, while the West does no development. All we do is mobilize massive military forces on the borders of these nations, uh, threatening war. I mean, don't you, don't you agree that this is a very, very great danger which is being brought about by this administration here? Well, it takes two, for ta two to tango, uh, and you know, I think the expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe helped to destroy the liberals in, in Moscow and bolster people like Putin. Um, so we are to blame for that. Um, but I don't think we're to blame for China trying to take over the South China Sea. Um, and I hope we're not <laughs> to blame for the new president in the Philippines. Um, well, he's angry because we criticize the way he's killing all the drug dealers. Uh, we'll, take, we'll take one more question, um, maybe two. We can put these two questions together back here, then we'll wrap it up. Okay, I, um, really quick question. You laid out um, 10 different policy options, and number 10 is the one you said we should pursue, which is negotiations. What I'm curious is, out of those 10, while some of them may not be able to work together, what package of those 10 would you suggest an administration follow? Because deterrence and negotiation are not necessarily antithetical to each other. Right. So right. what kind of package would you suggest? Maybe I'll hand the mic to the person behind you, then we'll take those two questions and we'll stop. Hi, Arbor Johnson. Um, my question, you alluded to this, but how can private sector humanitarian groups um, help with the engagement process? Or how should they be careful about aiding and abetting the evil regime? Thank you. Uh, well, those are both uh, <laughs> difficult questions to answer. The, uh, let me work on the second one first, about NGOs and peace groups. Um, the most promising thing that I know about is the Pyongyang University for Science and Technology, founded by American Korean Christians and Christians in South Korea. It's been there for two or three years now. <clears throat> they educate 500 of the creme de la creme, boys only. 
uh, until last year they invited 15 gra female graduate students. Um, supposed to be completely unpolitical, but inevitably, um, whatever, however these American Christian professors, how, how they live and talk, etc., it's got to have some kind of impact. The fact that <clears throat> they are free to call on Skype anybody in the world <laughs> must be actually mind-boggling uh, discovery for these North Korean students who are attending this university. But uh, so far, to my knowledge, uh, there's no evidence at all of some kind of a pollution effect on, on, these, on the Koreans, North Koreans who are studying there. But in the long run, something like that has got to be good, and probably, probably more will, will occur. Against this, there were some women, American women and women from other countries, who made a big deal of crossing the, uh, the DMZ um, about it, uh, so last year. Uh, and saying that they tend to be rather relativistic. You know, each side is equally responsible for all the trouble. And I think relativism is not right here. One, one side is much more responsible than, than the other. On balance, I think there's kind of a spectrum of evil in the world. Maybe I and you are, I hope, at one end of the spectrum, but there are other people who are at the far end, and governments that are at that end. And uh, how to, I think you and I could probably reach some agreement about where to have lunch or something, but to, to, to deal with a, another government that is really evil to its own people, et cetera, is, is a big deal. Um, so I'm against relativism, and yet I think that cultural exchange is, can't hurt us, so do it. Now, how to mix these various approaches? Yes, I think we need deterrence at the same time we negotiate. And a certain amount of hack and frack is probably useful to, to keep things in ferment in, in the North. Um, I think it's, uh, considering what, what is the United Nations, what is the United States, I think it's right for them to speak out and denounce and try to punish wrongdoing. Um, but I'm kind of doubtful that that will have much useful effect. I would think that despite what I said about trade and, and the reservations about culture, I think negotiation and engagement, are, is, yeah, after all they are, I think they're human beings over there even the, the top people in, in Pyongyang. And at some level, maybe we can get Jimmy Carter, you know, a Baptist who believed you talked to anybody, somehow did talk with Kim Jong, with uh, Kim Il-sung, and worked out the framework for the agreed framework. Um, and he did that with a lot of other bad guys around the world. So, yeah, I'm, I guess a, a certain amount of eclecticism. I don't think we should go to Fortress America, or I don't like strategic patients, and I don't like forgetting about them. Okay, the last thing I'll say is that uh, I think you're here because you're interested in Korea. But even if you're not, I'm going to recommend this book to you, which is for sale because of the interesting discussion in it about the theory of diplomacy, practice of diplomacy, and especially dealing with moral and ethical questions, international affairs. I think there's a lot of value in the book beyond just even just Korea. So uh, let me thank you for coming. Uh, let me thank Professor Clemens for a fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thank you.